Hello, OCD family community. OCD Awareness Week is in full swing, and hey, it's Friday, so that means we've got another great episode ready to share hope and resources for you, fam. So get comfy, because we're going to be chatting with Justin Hughes, LPC, about scrupulosity OCD. I'm Nicole Morris, licensed marriage and family therapist and mental health correspondent. And let me be the first to say, welcome to the family. The OCD family, that is. I am here to create a community of support for family members, spouses, partners, parents, adult children, as there may be adult words, and chosen family of OCD sufferers and their community. I've had over 22 years of experience in the mental health field, but please note that this information does not qualify or substitute as a diagnostic evaluation, therapy, or treatment, and it is presented on an as-is basis. Please follow up with a qualified mental health provider in your area regarding concerns for yourself or loved ones. Thank you for joining us today. Now, let's get started. Okay, fam. Okay. So I tend to meet with our amazing guests and record our episodes so we can all schedule and and balance time as needed. And when I was making my overall production schedule, while I knew Justin's episode would release today, I could in no way, no way predict the totality of what is happening in our world right now. I try to keep this space apolitical. And intentionally so. And that's not because I don't have beliefs and stances or you yours. I respect us all. And I want us to be inclusive to all people. Because guess what, fam? OCD affects everyone. No matter your race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, politics. OCD shows up. But today we're talking about scroop, which is a shorthand way of referencing scrupulosity or scruples, as you'll hear Justin share more about in a few minutes here. And while this often impacts people within their religious faith or traditions, it also hits on morality. And so I feel like my aim here isn't to be political at all, but to be human. And y'all, the, the utter devastation and horrific assault and murder of more Jews than has occurred on any day since the Holocaust. It scudded me. My heart is broken for the Jewish people. My heart is broken. And there, there really aren't words that can express the devastation. So I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment and really express my deepest sympathies for the atrocities taking place. And so I wanted to be mindful, and I want to hold space as we ease into today's topic, and Justin and I discuss Scroop a bit more. Also, on a a lighter note, I do want to take a moment to share and brag a bit more about Justin Hughes because he is a great and compassionate expert in our field, and I'm excited to share more about him with you, fam. So Justin is the owner of Dallas Counseling, PLLC. He's a clinician and a writer, and he's passionate about helping those impacted by OCD. He serves on the International OCD Foundation's OCD and Faith Task Force, and he is the Dallas Ambassador for OCD Texas. All right, Texas. <laughs> On a funny aside, Justin, when I was in graduate school, there were like nine or 10 of my cohorts that were from Texas, and they were Texas first, American second. They were lovely, and I, I loved their zest for Texas. So, Justin is the Dallas ambassador, and really, he has just worked with a diversity of clients, but he is also dual trained in psychology and theology, which is so important, especially when we're thinking about a conversation like we are having today. So he does well at helping folks understand the intersection between faith and OCD. So I'm going to link his info over on this episode's blog over at OCDFamilyPodcast.com. But you can learn more about him, too, at JustinKHughes.com. And I know, y'all, you're like, wait, I'm washing dishes. I'm driving. I'm running. I can't can't write this down right now. So, again, I got you. No worries. Head on over to the blog, and you can just click the hyperlink. We'll make it easy-peasy, lemon-squeezy for you. 
Also, fam, just to note, he has some amazing resources available over on his website as well, including free guides and handouts that you can download. So he's got a lot of great resources, not just on the intersection of faith and OCD, but also for OCD, anxiety, and other related disorders. So without further ado, let's get to chatting with Justin, because I really appreciate his humor his compassion, and his sensitivity to discussing all the things. And I'm sure you will, too. All right. Well, welcome back to the OCD Family Podcast. And we are welcoming a very special guest in Mr. Justin Hughes. Hi, Justin. Welcome. Hey, Nicole. Hi, everybody. Hi. It's so nice, first of all, to meet you. I think I saw you around at the conference. There were so many people and so many great presentations to attend at this year's International OCD Conference. But today we're coming on and you are, you're in the United States in the Dallas area, correct? Yep, Dallas, Texas. Yeah, and we're going to be talking about scrupulosity today. If scrupulosity, or as I like to call it, scroop, sometimes just make it a little, put a little jazz hands on it. But in terms of talking about scroop, a lot of people are like, I've never heard of that. And usually once we start to talk about it, they're like, oh, I know so many people that struggle with that. Isn't that kind of normal sometimes? And, you know, just interesting different conversation can come about. And so, first of all, I was wondering, because Justin, not only do you treat Scroop, you treat OCD, you treat a breadth of, OCD is not picky, so a breadth of different things. Anxiety disorders, substance abuse, comorbid, depression, phone block. Yep. Yep. All the the things. And so, for the purpose of the conversation we're going to create today, can you help the fam here understand when we're talking about scrupulosity, OCD, or scrupulosity in general, what are we, what do we mean by that? What is scrup? So I'll give the shortest and then I'll explain it a little bit further. So when we say scrupulosity, we are saying OCD and specifically with the manifestation into religious, spiritual, and moral territory. So <laughs> yeah. hard stop. I'll pause with that. More specific though, scrupulosity as a whole Mm -hmm. is a word. (laughs) We don't have the market on the word, just like OCD doesn't have the market on obsessive because obsessions can look different in different ways. What we mean in OCD is something very, very particular and distinct. Also the same with compulsive uh, as well. It's used in addictions and it's a correct term to use in addictions, but we mean it very specifically rather in OCD. So a scruple was the kind of the original English term that came mm-hmm. about. But is, if we go back as far as Cicero. Oh, let's do it. Let's go to what? Cicero, y'all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So Cicero and used, uh, it was basically scrupulum in Latin, which was reflecting kind of a small weight or measure. It's turned into scrupulous, uh, spelled a little bit differently. Shakespeare used scruple to reflect a small weight or quantity. But it started to be applied, especially in religious contexts and by clergy, particularly to reference like a stone, a little tiny pebble mm-hmm. with an annoyance in someone's shoe, ah. a scruple. Ah. And so then it ultimately almost became exclusively moral, religious, spiritual you know, around the I think 1400s or so, 1500s. And so if you want to understand what possible early OCD could look like, not always. Sometimes it was just somebody who it was highly performative of their beliefs are really, really stuck and it might not have fit. Just like there's a spectrum. There are people that have subclinical traits of OCD, but don't have OCD. Right. Uh, but if we want to find OCD, actually, that's how we find it is in the history of OCD. We tend to see it showing up with clergy. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I think is so cool that it makes that full circle when we're talking about scrupulosity today. Fast forward to the medical diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder after a lot of history. Happy to dig into any of those points, but I'll, I'll try to keep this at that mid-level of explanation. <laughs> yeah. With scrupulosity, we, we now see it as a subset of obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm-hmm. What is it? Recurrent, intrusive. Mm-hmm. unwanted mm-hmm. thoughts, urges, images, impulses, frankly, really any internal experience. Yeah. That's unwanted. 
repetitive. Yeah. And, and when we think of something that's intrusive, we can think of like so many of the thoughts that we associate with OCD are going to be mm-hmm. just that, those unwanted, unwelcome mm-hmm. thoughts, right? And so understanding the history is really interesting and helpful to know where that word came from, where it evolved from. It sounds real fancy if you say it to people. They're like, what is that? I don't know. Drupal. Right. <laughs> I'm going to use that in Scrabble. But it is actually pretty common. And so I found this article. This was a post that was, was posted and medically reviewed through GoodRx. I'm going to put it on the blog post for this episode, but it's quoting, I trust the research because I looked at the research, it's like Michael Tewig, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I don't know, we're good. Okay, but nice. yes, yes, who, who does a lot of work and research in ACT and acceptance and commitment therapy. But the statistic was really interesting to me. So this write-up for GoodRx, if you guys want to check it out, is from 2021. The research they cited was from 2013. I don't know, maybe you will if there is more recent research than this. But what I found interesting, as they said, in the U.S. alone, an estimated 2.3% of people will experience OCD in their lifetime. And of that percentage, of the 2.3, as many as 33% will experience scrupulosity specifically. Bingo. Yep. That's the recent research. Yeah. And so I was looking at that and I thought, you know what? I'm not surprised by that. And yet I would not doubt. (laughs) <laughs> ironic. I would not doubt that that number is higher because I think it's probably very, very mm-hmm. underreported. And mm-hmm. if you've ever attended the Faith and OCD conference, if you didn't know there's a Faith and OCD conference, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, during our time together. Yeah. But you'll hear many people talk about how they've grown up with these different thoughts, how they've been afraid. We look at the church culture, we look at ethnicities and the community culture, the family's culture. And some of this stuff is like, I can't, I can't even consider uttering this really unwanted thought that I maybe had that could jeopardize my understanding yeah, yeah. of my faith. Yeah. And so it doesn't get reported or when it does, if it does, depending on the staff and the clergy and, you know, even the type of religion, How they're going to respond to that is going to make a huge difference in whether they further internalize and shame themselves because they think Mm -hmm. this is a faith issue when it's a Mm -hmm. mental Mm -hmm. health issue. Or they, they, there are some growing, just as we were talking about before recording, there's some progression and, and evolution in thoughts Mm -hmm. within different groups within religions as well. But sometimes they are met with a well-understood person that can bridge with mm-hmm. them and go, here's the faith, and here's where we could connect you with the therapist because it sounds like there's some mental health stuff too. Uh, mm-hmm. But I would say on average, most people aren't going to be understanding of Scroop. So as we kind of dive in a little more, I sometimes hesitate giving examples of what presentations can look like because people will sometimes be like if doing the checklist. And if my thing doesn't show up, then that's proof that, no, this was a me problem. It wasn't actually OCD because I didn't hear those exact words. Mm-hmm. But we know that OCD is as creative <laughs> and immaculate mm-hmm. as the design that is our brains and our creativity. And so just to give folks a few examples, because I think when people hear examples, they're like, oh, yeah, no, no, haven't most people had that thought before? So let's talk about what some of those scrupulous thoughts could look like, both within like a religious context. And then when we say within a moral context, what that could look like as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to flip it on its head because a lot of times they start with religious, spiritual, but I'll, I'll start with the moral here today. I like ah, it. Mix it up. Be yeah. flexible. And I want listeners to hear a broad base of examples to, to catch them. So with moral scrupulosity, it can be something just related to the, the performance, the follow through of moral beliefs. It shows up in any number of ways. Actually, a, a great example recently with a couple of clients. I don't know why this popped up a little bit more recently, like one of those interesting things. <laughs> I went to Chipotle yesterday mm-hmm. to enjoy my bowl, which is so good. I, I love it. <laughs> it's yeah. not a plug for Chipotle. And, it, it is lunchtime, though. Um, we're like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Oh, if if I get a, a soda, or depending on where you're from, pop, pop. <laughs> Coca Cola. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say soda. Do you share one soda with someone else if you're married or whatnot? I personally have been on two different sides of this equation, and I know somebody specifically who talked about this as an example. And they have a lot of joy in being uh, attentive towards not giving their spouse extra soda. It, it literally, they told me that they'll say to their spouse, hey, can I have a drink? It's like, no, like this, is, <laughs> <laughs> take the card or I'll, I'll go get you one, like in a very kind and joyful and, and humorous manner. In a but, joyful spousal way. Like what yeah. you mean is like, no, <laughs> that's the joyful spousal way. That's funny. Yeah. And he really, that was his confession. And I've, I've had that at different points. So I don't hold to that now where if my, my wife wants a drink of my soda, okay, fine with unlimited refills, but it would be just a small example where it doesn't have to be out of a spiritual belief or religious belief. A lot of times it can be, but just the morality of something, it can come down to basic laws, could be traffic laws, could be how a person has treated another person. Will they be seen as caring or altruistic or giving? And this is where it shows up a lot for atheists and people that don't have a specific worldview religiously. Right. Uh, and so it's important that people hear they just really crosses over into any number of things. And I think maybe more obviously it's going to be with religion and spirituality. But if you're here today with any number of examples, I just don't want anybody to think, well, that's that's not me because, you know, I'm not going to the priest or I'm not you know, confessing this or I'm not praying or feeling really, really alone because it could be the person who doesn't have any particular system that they they follow, but they find themselves compulsively praying. That shows up too. Atheists. Oh, yeah. For, oh, yeah. <laughs> for sure. With yeah. atheism. I've I've seen it quite a bit actually with atheism and and there's that fear. And it's not sometimes people will be like, well, maybe they're just agnostic because they're kind of questioning. And it's like, no, yeah. they have an identity. And this is where we like to talk about words like ego dystonic and ego syntonic. They have an identity. Fancy terms. <laughs> I know. We're, we're full of the fun terms. We, we, we could have a, a lot of fun at a party together. We can feel better about ourselves yes, that way. We could play Taboo, which would be a great game for a bunch Ooh, of yeah. OCD <laughs> treatment folks. The fam, that we could have fun with that. But yeah, it's interesting because if you identify, say you identify as an atheist, and yet you feel yourself having whether you're consciously aware of why you're feeling the upset or you're just feeling it and you can't put your finger on it and you find yourself praying that could add a lot of distress especially mm -hmm. when you're praying out of that function of kind of covering your bases even though you don't believe in bases per se or whatnot and because it's mm -hmm. ego dystonic it's really distant from how you see and understand yourself how you see and understand the world it it feels intrusive it feels distressing when something mm -hmm. is in line with our values then we're like oh yeah well maybe it is maybe it's not i mean that would be i think more in line ego syntonic with somebody that maybe is questioning but not landing firm anywhere per se maybe a, an agnostic mm -hmm. or so i'm not doing great definitions but just for the sake of of you know giving us a little bit of an example and so, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like if you have a certain kind of moral ethical code that you live by, like don't park mm -hmm. in the handicapped spaces and want to be able to do good for the world, or maybe not even know what that ambition is, but worry that you haven't done enough. What's your purpose? Um, yeah, that can yeah. show up a lot in that moral group realm, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially the with that example, it may just sound so light, but when we're talking about OCD, this is going to be the person that it haunts them, it bugs them. It, it's more than just a passing thought. So I don't have OCD, but have struggled with any number of intrusions, doubts, fears, getting hooked on different things for periods of time. But they, for me, at one point, I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and, and mm -hmm. so grateful to say in full remission with that. But I, I still get these, I can have a, a whole day where I get tripped on something or, or whatnot. And a lot of people just are like, yeah, yeah, oh, I get that. But I just want to be really, really clear that OCD is different. It is a different animal. So it may be playing on, sure, some of the same 
thoughts and content and doubts on a human spectrum. But with the, the soda machine example, uh, somebody in OCD, if that's a problem, maybe they've skipped going out to eat because they're haunted by any number of thoughts. And what mm -hmm. if I grab too many napkins or did I really need one napkin? You know, and then environmental consciousness shows up a lot and even the moral scrupulosity too. Like, oh, yeah. well, that was more wasteful than I needed to be. And I should have just stayed at home and eaten on plates and fill in the blank. And the person is homebound at this point because they're really, really stuck. And those things can get missed for agoraphobia. It can get missed for being anti, anti-social, not in what we mean as counselors, psychologists, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. like not wanting to be around people. The colloquial. The yeah. 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 And one of the things I've discovered in my practice, this is just kind of an experiential reference. I don't have research for this, but mm -hmm. if a client comes in and I start to first work with them and they say they, they lock up, they're wanting to describe something different, but they just can't. Mm -hmm. In my experience, 99% of the time, it's something sexual or it's something religious. And sometimes and, both, right? Because those sometimes two both. can yeah. really oh. tango. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So it shows up in a whole lot of different ways, as you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's, yeah, when we think about it even more broadly within the moral, ethical, doing right, doing good, whatever that means, I mean, that is that is kind of operationalized differently across people. And it operationalizes differently within people. You were just saying, like, I used to be more on that side of, of the soda, and now I'm on this side, you know, so mm -hmm. we can see even those shifts and changes within us. I've actually never seen a case. You tell me if you have, Justin. I've never seen a case or heard about a case where OCD only showed up in one little area, and that was like, Oh, oh, we kicked that to the curb and I feel great. And it doesn't show up again because it's a That's shapeshifter. Funny. It is. It's your you brain. Know, right? I've seen it a few times, but it's typically catching it early when it's mild. Generally. Yeah. And I think time. people can have, as with anything in the DSM and the DSM being our diagnostic and statistical manual, like we can read criterion and be like, oh, I've done that before. Does that mean I'm disordered? No, it means you're a human. You got a brain. It's brainy. It's not just a matter of do I meet a criterion? It is, is this criterion in combo with some other criterion and mm -hmm. factors That's right. That's really right. going on for a certain amount of time, demonstrating a certain presentation that then interferes with my functioning? Because you might have a preference on the soda thing, but it probably doesn't keep you up at night. For some people, it right. could, right? Yeah. And so that's where we start going, like, if I can't function because this could happen, maybe. Mm -hmm. And even yeah. if it does happen and it's not so bad, the brain still wants to be like, but maybe next time it'll be worse. Maybe got lucky yeah. this time. Then that's, that's where we're starting to see OCD kind of pipe in. And you made a good point about that with intrusions, too, because you're saying, I've had intrusions, but I don't have OCD. All people are capable of having intrusions. So ninety four percent plus three six says. Yeah, and the other six percent, who knows who they are? Who knows? Non responsive. What's no, just kidding. Knows? And so oh. it, it is interesting, and not just in the spiritual realm, but we tend to see it in the spiritual realm as well. And yeah. so, can you talk with? You're pretty open about practicing your faith as well as practicing as a therapist. Whether you have a faith or not, I'm guessing you are welcome to come and, and get a consultation with Justin and see if that's a right fit. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. yeah. But you you were also mentioning we do see it a, a bit more in the spiritual realm. And so, can you give an example, just like we went through that moral example of some of the things we might see? pop up as obsessional in the spiritual group. Absolutely. Yeah. In the spiritual realm. So a very, very common one for Christians is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. or the unpardonable sin, the unforgivable sin. I just got a question about that this week. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, That's I live here thing. in the Bible Belt. Certainly have heard that one. I've heard it within clients. I've heard it within family. So yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in in essence, for those who don't know what the reference is, there is a passage where Jesus talked about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit being unforgivable. And for 
even even Christians that don't have OCD, <laughs> this mm. passage does make the average person a bit uncomfortable. It, it's not just the pleasant reading. It's it's not what a lot of Christians will will go to if they're you know, wanting to uh, just be encouraged for the day. Read a psalm, mm-hmm. <laughs> for example. Mm-hmm. For, a fighter verse, like through these trials in suffering produces endurance, endurance produces hope, except, right? Right. That's not what people are reading for the leisure reading, but for, for Christians, it's a really important passage for sure. And here's the thing, the experts don't have an exact consensus on that, but there's certainly an obvious answer as to what it is. Mm-hmm. But the problem is in the margins of what if. Could it mean something a little bit more restrictive? So the obvious answer is intentional, willful, constant rejection of God. It logically follows, right? So if it's like, okay, so if I'm to trust in God, and if I don't trust in God, then it logically follows that I don't trust in God. Right. (laughs) And so that's kind of the biggest argument is that the person who has that status of total rejection Mm -hmm. has the status of total rejection. (laughs) Right. And that's that's how I interpret it. But it's tricky in all fairness. I could be wrong for sure. And OCD loves to wedge itself in those little nuances. But what if? And so folks will will really keep studying. And really, when it comes down to it, most of the time are assessing their feelings. How do I feel about God or the Holy Spirit? And so if I read that passage and I noticed a smirk on my face, I noticed a swear word come into my mind or a blasphemous thought come into my mind. Clearly, that's the proof. I, I must be rejecting God. And what are the pathological processes and responses that go into that? What does the person who is committed and faithful, what do they do with this? And what is the person who struggles with that but doesn't have OCD? What do they do with that, that passage? And then what do I do right. <laughs> in OCD? And really breaking that down and then being able to do exposures, which exposures does not mean blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Exposures would be to say, okay, what feels like it, but ultimately <laughs> my, my clergy member is saying, no, it's, it's not that. So maybe it's even saying the phrase, actually, most of my clients, that's probably about a level five, six out of 10 hierarchy exposure is just to say the phrase. Yeah. Because what if saying phrase is doing it? Well, that one's pretty easy to rationale out because it's like, well, if you read the phrase, right? It's not if you <laughs> they wrote it, it in the book, the word apparently. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But a lot of times I have to start way softer with that to be like, okay, yeah. so can you can you sit with just that conceptual feeling right now? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. let's practice some response prevention. How do we do that? Okay, well, there's a hundred skills that go into the moment of response prevention. So let's sit with that discomfort without having to cancel it out, without having to pray, without having to undo, without having to read other scriptures, without having to give it proof, without having to get reassurance. So on the blank. Right. Blast. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about two parts just for folks who are newer to this, where you were mentioning the exposures. This might be a lower level exposure and the, also the response prevention. And so just wanted to know, so within ERP, that's exposure and response prevention, that is one of our evidence-based treatments for the treatment of OCD, we look at how the benefit of not only exposing ourselves to that distressing thought, image, sound, it can, it can manifest these obsessions are not just thought mental obsessions they certainly can be but it could be an image it could be the thought of something that you consider very sacrilegious and very heretical or triggering and the fact fact that you had that thought now that feels like evidence because i had a thought right Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so when we talk about the treatment it's about exposing ourselves to the thoughts And we're not going to do a deep dive on ERP here. There's certainly, you can go back to earlier episodes here on the podcast as well, IOCDF and a number of other resources to learn more about the process of ERP. But in that process, we essentially, long story short, and you tweak it if you you think there's a, a way we can improve it for sure. 
But we are learning that the engagement in the compulsions, whether it's mom, do you think, or honey, do you think that I had this thought that I'm a bad person? I better go confess it to the priest or the pastor or the leader here or the rabbi, you know, whomever, bishop. It can become very distressing. And so people will act on or think on, sometimes maybe try to cancel out that bad thought with a favorite scripture or reread the Bible 10 times and then internet search <laughs> analysis and commentaries on it and all the things, right? And so those compulsions, engagement in the compulsions is actually what can reinforce that learning in the brain. So in response prevention, we're literally preventing the response to the compulsion. Much easier right. said than done. You wouldn't be in therapy if you were like able to just be like, no, I'm not going to do that. It's very, very difficult. But yeah. Doing that response prevention is part of it. So you're saying like even a lower level exposure could look like sitting in there and saying the thought. Because the fear is if I say the thought, maybe it is true, could come true, might come more often. When actually being able to sit with the thought and not have that whole response cycle is what helps create new learning in the brain. Uh, And so. and Great stir step. Yeah. And and the point, too, ideally, we feel less distressed. Generally, we do. But even if we don't feel less distressed, the idea is distress in and of itself isn't a biomarker of this shit's real. It's really a feeling that you're feeling in that moment. And I think sometimes we can get caught up on, oh, if I'm feeling this distress, then I must be in ginger. I must have done something wrong. I am this bad person. Uh, and so it can create that whole chasm of uh, feeling really stuck and scared in that, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> so one of the things then that you do is have folks really be able to kind of approach it in a gradual way, in that stair-step way, as you, as you said. And here's where a little bit of a trickiness comes in. And by a little bit, I mean a lot of trickiness comes in. Mm-hmm. Depending on the denomination, depending on the type of religion or moral or ethical code that you're ascribing to, but depending on a number of factors, sometimes that thought that you had, who are folks most likely to go talk to first, other than people within their family? They mm-hmm. may go to the clergy. They may go That's to right. the management of whether it's PETA or whatever, whoever is helping run things and they'll say so yeah i had this thought (laughs) let's let's just pick a thought that i was blasphemous okay and for anybody that doesn't understand what blasphemy means could you give like a real basic yeah so i guess a more universal definition would be attributes vile unworthy unholy thoughts beliefs yeah towards that which is holy, pure, et cetera. Right. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to give kind of a more universal definition there. Yeah. Uh, and at some level, that's going to break down, obviously, into more specifics for different beliefs. Right. And so particularly, I can, I'll just speak for my family as an example. My dad went to a seminary and got an MDiv in graduate school back in the day. He had to take courses on counseling because, of course, as a pastor, you're going to have to shepherd different people. They're going to come to you with their problems. And they read books. I want to say, I'm looking right now, I think it was Jay Adams is kind of what's sticking out in my mind. Yeah, uh, Competent to Counsel, uh, Jay Adams. Yes. Uh Okay, you're aware of it. I haven't Mm -hmm. read it, to be honest, Justin. But when I went away to school to become a therapist, like, why would you do that when there's the church that does the counseling? Now, ultimately, and not really pertinent to the the purposes of this episode, but ultimately, he is not working in that line of work anymore. Still a believer, but not working in that line anymore. And had experienced some things that kind of helped prompt him to say, I need to exit here. And it's another story for another day for, for the beer drinks, right? But one of the conversations I remember having with him many, many decades at at this point ago was that, you know, incompetent to counsel. And again, so I will let people know I haven't read this, but per his paraphrasing of it, he talked about how 
if you were feeling anxiety, if you were feeling distressed, if you were feeling any of these things, it was a result of the sin in your own life. And what you needed to do was to resolve the sin in your own life. And that would lead you to a place of peace. And even so far as, you know, that anxiety will be gone, you won't want to cheat on your spouse. All these different things, like it could, it could be applied in a myriad of ways. And here in the Bible Belt, the times have changed and have there is a lot of progression. There are going to be some more traditional, shall I say, folks that practice a little more conservatively, a little less modern, <laughs> that are really going to cling to, yes, all all feelings that are negative, all the bad, could be attributed to the sin in your life. And so if you have a thought that is blasphemous and you're like oh my gosh that is against my higher power my god and you have that understanding you have the backing even from the pulpit going and if you had that thought yeah it's it's because you're a sinner and well you could objectively i guess say well aren't we all whatever but yes that's in the world you need to reconcile that. You need to ask for forgiveness. You need to resolve the sin that's causing that as if it was your fault. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. you have anxiety now. And that is a dangerous, difficult mm-hmm. thing that does happen, not just within Christianity, it happens within Catholicism, within Judaism, within atheism, even, you know, mm-hmm. in terms mm-hmm. of where the messaging coming down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. reinforces mm-hmm. that intrusive fear. So when we talk about scrupulosity, it gets tricky sometimes because people want to yeah. know, where can I draw the line between my mental health and my spiritual health? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like there's a line. Like you're like, yeah, exactly. oh, it's a line. Look, it's got, it's sparkly. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the Mason-Dixon line. We just got it. Oh, look at that accent. He's got, he's got some Texas going for us there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, oh, yeah, it's, it comes particularly tricky. And you know what's interesting? Yeah, I don't, I don't know, Jay Adams personally, I've, I've read parts of Competent to Counsel, so not the whole book. So I, I, I don't know well enough to represent him on this. I will say that the takeaways for many people are exactly what you said. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's actually what's taught, but the takeaways are often exactly what you said, mm-hmm. that the, the message seems to be a pretty clear line of demarcation. If you have anxiety, first of all, some teachers will fall on the camp that anxiety is sin. Mm-hmm. And so right off the bat, that's a sin. <laughs> and then if, if it's because of sin as well, then you need to resolve the sin. Then a person coming in who has OCD, that, that's just a complex place to be. Now, actually, so one thing that I'll throw out there and I will share. Is it okay to share personal belief? Because I think it would actually yeah. be helpful. Yeah, yes. Yeah. You are welcome. Yeah. This is the fam. We keep it real. Yes. So feel free. All right, free. fam. Feel Here free. we go. Feel free. Yeah. Okay. So as I work with a lot of backgrounds and belief systems, as I will respect anybody who comes in, I do work a lot with Christians as a Christian. People send me out. I went to a well-known Christian seminary for my training, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing that I'll share is philosophically, theologically, the starting point of what you said is what I believe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the, that, that sin piece that both personal and in corporate, like in the world, but also personally, that mm-hmm. I am a sinner and I need God. Mm-hmm. And also that the world's brokenness is seen as both results from and also maintenance of mm-hmm. ongoing sin. I do believe that. And, and I believe most Christians do because that's Christian doctrine. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that being said, what do we do with that? A lot of people were maybe squirming in their seats a little bit <laughs> mm-hmm. right now. What's interesting is that the, the problem with what, what you were talking about is that, first of all, there is an interpretation that anxiety must be sin. Mm-hmm. Interpretation. And second of all, that how it is resolved must be through X, Y, Z. And Christian doctrine also teaches that it is back to the Holy Spirit, that it's the Holy Spirit who reveals. And so the moments that I'm using my checker, <laughs> so to speak, 
mentally feeling wise or whatever to figure that out anyway. Mm-hmm. I'm actually off points from Christian doctrine anyway, which people can start to freak out like, no. So to approach it graciously is words of Jesus. My, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Actually following Jesus is also other passages that talk about how hard it is. Well, there's a hardness and there's a lightness to that. And I think what happens a lot of times, again, I can't speak for a specific person, but seeing the results in those that I work with is that they have experienced burdens heaped up on their shoulders from other people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes religious trauma, people who were critical, were controlling repetitively, and there are people that are hurting and people who have been hurting and on the recovery set, lots of, lots of church hurt and also lots of other, other types of hurt in us. And I'm going to say that that initial starting point, the comments, I hold to that too. It's a Christian doctrine comment. But the application of that, what do I do with that? What does that mean? <laughs> mm-hmm. That's where I'm going to divert to say, well, first of all, there are really good, solid teachers who fall on different lines of anxiety as a sin. Anxiety is not. I want to mention two names. I'll name drop here. John Piper believes anxiety is a sin. Max Lucado does not. And they both have a lot of, they have a big platform. Absolutely. Read a lot of books, resources from both myself, enjoy different points and pieces. But I, from the argument from the perspective, I have a lot of friends here. And even that I went to seminary with are on that the other line that they approach things more I would say it's closer to pastoral counseling. Mm -hmm. So even if they don't want to get an LPC, by and large, they're working with folks in the church and it's uh, biblical pastoral type counseling. Mm -hmm. Like LPC folks being licensed professional counselor, if you're like, what? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, no, you're good. You're good. Thank you. You're good. (laughs) Thank you. So that's that's fine. And I know many that do some really, really great work and are helping people in relationships and parenting and marriage and application of the faith and so forth. But back to the OCD piece and why I'm starting to get so bold and comfortable speaking of different faiths, too. At first, I felt uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Doing this publicly, frankly, because I have more historically been afraid that other Christians are going to hear me talking about atheism and Islam and Christianity and being like OCD, here's how it shows up. And that basically I'm going to get canceled. (laughs) Right. (laughs) You're endorsing other religions, which is not to say I don't want to make it sound like Christians are going to sit there and be judgy because Christians do get a very bad rap for being judgy when all people (laughs) have their different thoughts and sure, different sure. ways yeah. of conceptualizing things and that's and yeah. and it's not fair for us to paint with a broad brush yeah. and be like all of you think this that happens so often though you'll hear well that's what the church thinks that's what the christians say yeah sure. so yeah thanks thanks for the graciousness there yeah so it's it's one of those things that i started to realize no like to talk about how this shows up in the same ways regardless of what you believe is is kind of like the the best thing to emphasize because it's emphasizing that OCD is OCD is OCD is OCD is OCD is OCD. Yeah. That obsessions are obsessions are obsessions. And that when we really, really spend time, mm-hmm. and that's the thing, when I hear of Christian arguments that are the person needs to pray more, the person needs to fill in the blank more, blah, blah, blah. first of all, that's just more works. I'm going to throw that out there. But it's... It's really, really interesting because <laughs> it kind of it misses it misses the actual details. I mean, people are feeling alone anyway mm-hmm. with OCD, mm-hmm. but people who know it start to hear other people talking about it like they do and realizing this person doesn't. Yeah, it breaks down a lot of a lot of trust and awareness. People who spend time and I think of Ted Witzig up in Illinois, who's yeah. a bivocational pastor and psychologist. What? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. Like, and you may, uh, if you've ever gone to a group talk at a conference and or ADAA, he has a lot of good resources out there too. Yeah. 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 And so I think that not completely, I actually, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of churches doing a really, really great job, but a lot of people come into counseling being told that the sun revolves around the earth for their whole lives. Mm-hmm. 
And people on the outside are like, what? <laughs> people are like, huh? Mm -hmm. And then when the person with OCD starts to realize, holy cow, the advice that they've been given didn't really get OCD. So when I hear people towing the line of, no, this is a prayer thing, this is da 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 I've never heard an example of somebody that's spent thousands of hours with people who have OCD. Now, they, they could exist, and they probably do, I'm sure, somewhere, somebody who has a family member with OCD. But I'm, I'm meaning people who spend thousands and thousands of hours with understanding these dynamics that go into obsessions and compulsions and the manifestations that they have. I have never heard a single person, and it were, to move outside of a Christian teacher as well, it can be any number of backgrounds, that doesn't have a little extra insight to be like, oh, something different. Something, something more at play. Here. Yeah. Something more at play. We need to work with this. And this has been evidence when I talked about the history. Part of, as I write my book, chapter one is hidden that history hard. I did a deep dive, and I'm, I'm still doing that. We discovered OCD. Probably, first of all, in literature from clergy, because they were the ones talking about that's, these things. Yeah, yeah, that's on my list of things to yeah. discuss. <laughs> yes. And so, like, people who really, really spend time with it and stay invested and don't stay distant from it. Mm -hmm. Don't. I've never come across a person who, who does that and also is the one who's still saying, well, you just need to keep praying more. You need to keep confessing sin more. It's the opposite. Clergy who aren't even OCD specialists have any number of tools in their toolkit to be like, ah, here is how I work with the scrupulous. Right. I'm it's good to hear your thoughts on it. I think one of the hardships is because we're kind of thinking about for maybe someone that's in the religious practice, but like attending maybe somebody who is sitting in the services or handing out bulletins, but it's not exclusive to OCD can hit anybody and it can it can certainly strike those that are charismatic and great public speakers and have a passion and maybe even a scrupulous fear that has led them to become a preacher or teacher or a pastor of any sort and so it's almost like I have to do this or dot 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 one of the kind of key giveaways for me is it the I have to do this to feel closer to God or do I have to do this to right my wrong that keeps me from my higher power yeah, right yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. because often when it's the mental health issue God Buddha whoever whoever your higher power the non-existent maybe it's just being a good environmentalist it could be so many different things right being the best person you could be if you're sitting there engaging in the act to minimize neutralize or avoid the distress that you may have really actually become this bad person what if you're this monster that you know that isn't good that is immoral what you know fill in the blank then that sounds like it's functioning as a compulsion. If you're doing it and you're saying this is value driven because it it creates closer intimacy, closer relationship, connection, worship, whatever. There can be many different words or experiences. Maybe it's being one with Mother Nature. I mean, it can look so many different ways. Then that sounds more egocentric in sync with what your purpose is. And when you think about going to church, what is your purpose? Is your purpose just to avoid hell? I mean, that might be in there for some folks. They might be like, yeah, uh, uh, that's my purpose. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be in outer darkness. I don't want to be in whatever these spaces that it could be, purgatory. But is most of your engagement, whether it's going and hearing a lesson or a sermon, participating in a class, in a small group of people or a community group, is it to grow closer to your higher power, your God, or is it to kind of wipe out and absolve the slate here so that you can be in good standing? Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. so That's if good, it's moving, separation. yeah, it's moving towards relationship. But sometimes the very charismatic, very well intentioned, sometimes scared with their own scrupulosity person at the pulpit or at the lectern or on the microphone. It's dealing with scrupulosity, and they have a big platform to be able to talk more to that. And so 
it can be hard because you can go, well, I already maybe had this fear and then they're saying it. And now I feel like even more ashamed because, yeah, yeah obviously this is yeah. me. I can't even show up here until I, I can write this. I might have to yeah. start avoiding services even because I'm not worthy because, yes, he's calling me out. That's me. I'm guilty. I'm yeah. convicted. That's a word you'll hear, too. I just, I, this, I just felt really convicted by that. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. how would you recommend for folks that may be in that kind of face situation, but also may be struggling with mental health, with OCD? And it doesn't have to just be OCD. It could be depression. It could be generalized anxiety. There's a number of things people struggle with. Yes. Yes. But what what tips would you have for helping people? Because sometimes they're going to go talk to their pastor. They're going to talk to the leader in their church and they're going to be like, yeah, they're going to get that Jay Adams feel of, yep, I've really screwed up. It's somehow me that and this is a me problem. And I, I I'm I'm a mess, which is what I was afraid of. Mm, yeah. Yeah. What to do with that? Send your donations in to the OCD family podcast today of twenty nine ninety five <laughs> payments. And wow. Support. Thanks, Total Justin. Total relief of anxiety and fears. <laughs> I can't do it, y'all. But, you know, <laughs> yes. that's and, funny. and first of all, so far as I know, there's no one fix. And I think it's important to start with that. I think that somebody who says, even clinicians who say, you will be cured, fixed, your anxiety will be gone in X number of sessions. They're selling you something. They may be right about something, but it, it, <laughs> it's, it is a process. There's a lot of growth in these things. Some people need a lot more additional points of support to grow. Some people need one or two key ones. So that being said, look out for the snake oil salesman mm -hmm. who's my... I have the solution for OCD or for scrupulosity or anxiety or depression or whatever. And sometimes a person can be right conceptually or theologically about something. So I, I, I'm going to say, and sorry, I don't mean to offend my the atheist listeners, but I believe there is a God. Absolutely. Yeah, believe <laughs> so, it. You don't have to be ashamed or anything of that. So when it comes down to it and... The whole thing, it, this applies to addiction or depression or whatever. Okay, well, if you were trusting God, would you trust that he has your good in mind? Yes. Mm -hmm. But duh, like, mm -hmm. duh, come yeah. on. Like, if it was that is, easy, the person's tried that. You know, they, they've tried yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> where is the space? Where is the room for, for the struggle? And that's where... I'm going to work as a clinician, as a supporter, as friends with OCD, loved ones, et cetera, is to get into the mess. And frankly, I think that's what Jesus would do is to, to be in the mess of these things. And so getting into that mess, mm -hmm. there's a few key things that I think are really, really important. So somebody starting out, mm -hmm. just getting a little bit of information. Yeah, please. <laughs> So jump on IOCDF or go to Ted Witzig's accounseling.org. You can go to my website. I'm sure you'll include in the links. I'm not going to oh, yeah. give a big marketing push for it, but find a couple of reputable resources that you think could be. Go for maybe two or three. I don't want anybody making me the end arbiter of mm -hmm. their faith. Mm -hmm. um, and that can happen, you know, with human nature in general, for sure. But then also, especially with OCD, mm -hmm. I don't want to be the just the scrupulosity guy or the Christian scrup guy or OCD, because first of all, like that's the weight that I, I don't want. And <laughs> I am human. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. said plenty of things and will continue to say plenty of things wrong. And so the key is to, to start out with somebody who gets it just a little bit more mm -hmm. new reputable websites etc oftentimes is a good start or a few books uh can be a good start it doesn't even have to be a scrupulosity oriented book jonathan grayson's freedom from obsessive freedom compulsive from. disorder references uh that quite a bit uh, the classic guide is probably joseph sirachi's uh, mm -hmm. doubting disease mm -hmm. towards it and then uh, a lot of others and, and many in the works and, and mm -hmm. i'll have a, a book come out at some point too but the information is I think it's that starting point. But then very quickly, very, very quickly after that is as much as possible, find a trusted other. 
Yes. And it requires kind of going out on a limb for some people. Some it's going to be much more obvious, like, oh, yeah, I know this person's trusted. I just need to get up the courage or pray for the courage or, or try to have this conversation. And starting with a possible trusted other to talk about it because it just has to be. I, I love OCD family as, as a name because we do this in community. Yeah. We don't recover alone. Some people, yes, do. They go to treatment. They don't need the additional thing. They don't have to go to the conference or continue to download podcasts or read a book to be in good recovery. And no, that's not a bad thing. That's a wonderful thing. Good for you. Mm -hmm. But OCD is serious mental illness and one of the top most disabling conditions in the world, including medical conditions. And so having others, there's so much shame, so much weight and pressure, just, just for even having it and, and the thoughts that come up and so much embarrassment. So even just trying just to share one little thing, just it doesn't have to be the whole thing, but just like, hey, do you ever get thoughts that you don't want? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes I get thoughts about God that I really wish I didn't have, like my, my, my wishes. But then I also doubt whether I even want to have them too. Do you ever have that? Sometimes it's just that you might have to pump a person a little bit with a few questions just to yeah. test out the water. See yeah. you know, if, if the person's like, no, nope. <laughs> it sounds like you need to pray. <laughs> well, thank you for your time. Uh huh. Not to say that that person's a bad person, but or no, they're bad. bad. Just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> kidding, family. Kidding. <laughs> little little humor. That's what the fam does, right? They they take their shots. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. But move move on along down that road. And I, I think those are the two biggest things. And then there's going to be uh, 30 different things that I do with people in therapy. But for today, I just want to throw that out there since this is kind of an intro to Scroop. They think that those are the two biggest things as the feeling alone and the hiddenness about it is really, really huge. And that's been written about for hundreds of years, frankly, mm -hmm. that people have felt so embarrassed and ashamed and mm -hmm. would hesitate to share these scruples that they had. So that, that's that's a big one. It's not quite the same as ERP, even though you'll conversion and response prevention. You'll get many times people have exposures in communicating. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I'm mentioning it, I'm meaning it most specifically for get in community, please, for the love of all that's good, get in some sort of community, connect with another who is trustworthy. Yeah. And if you build a team too, then as you proceed forward, whether it's with religious pastoral counseling or with a licensed mental health professional, including that community that you have built and trust, so it doesn't mean you need to go put it on Facebook or snap all the people and be like, hey, this is what I'm doing. But being able to to help include folks is really helpful because then we learn whether something is helpful feedback and providing information or it can be harmful and we're doing reassurance for a compulsion. And so just being able to expand that net, knowledge is power, and then, mm -hmm. then you have your cheerleaders. And not just cheerleaders, other people that you'll often find with lived experience as well. And so I think that is really helpful. You know, another thing I think about in terms of finding a trusted provider, and I tell people, I'm like, so where's the line, right? That's like, that's, they're like, yeah, 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 where's the uh, line though, right? I'm so glad we're talking about this. Yeah. yeah. And I'll say to them, here's the great news. You don't have to figure out that line. That's I right. don't have that's to right. figure that's out right. that line. First of all, you know, a lot of different religions will see this higher power as kind of the almighty, right? The omnipotent, the infallible. One of the ways as we kind of expand that out is we go, okay, like especially within the Christian faith, God is all-knowing. He does not make errors, right? He's infallible. But humans make errors all the time. And and actually, errors can be a great part of our growing experience. You know, we learn to ride a bike, not usually by just understanding the physics of it and going and observing. We make some errors. We learn about our center of gravity, our balance, all those different things. And so in terms of the good news is we don't have to be infallible. And OCD what we learn is, yeah, uncertainty mm -hmm. exists in the world, and mm -hmm. you're not always going to know things, yeah. right? That does, yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't mean you can't have a good relationship, a faith relationship, a faith-based marriage. It doesn't mean you can't have it be a good 
activists for making sure that we're helping with environmental causes, if that's how Scoop might be showing up for someone, it could just be a myriad of different ways. And so what I will say is I am a therapist. I may have certain awarenesses about how different faiths function, but it isn't my job to find the sparkly line of what's faith because that's not my field. Whether whether you practice or not, you're coming to me for the mental health. So I know <laughs> mental health and I know OCD. And what I can say is I can I can work on that really well. So then partnering with somebody that that person does trust, maybe a clergy, maybe a staff member, maybe a Bible study leader, whatever, finding people you can bridge with that really understand the faith piece then, because they're not going to know where the line of mental health is either. It's not their thing. Yes, we all have mental health, but we're not going to know. And so being able to sit in the unknowing with the right guides in the right spaces Mm-hmm. that makes a huge difference yeah yeah well said being able to sit in the right space oh i love that and that's it's really really hard sometimes not well hopefully not not by death we <laughs> maybe you've had this experience nicole i i lose some people just after that first session i lose patients and i usually don't know exactly the reason but i have a pretty good guess mm-hmm. that just for whatever reason it it just it, they couldn't be okay with X, Y, Z. Um, so I explain the exposure process and I try to approach it as light as I can and to explain the interaction from a faith standpoint and, and how you can uphold faith and so forth. And sometimes a, a person's just, there. there is zero wiggle room mm-hmm. to be able to be with an uncomfortable feeling or thoughts that they could be violating their, their faith and, and beliefs, morality, God. And... Obviously, I'm not asking them to, but when it seems that way, feels that way, when there's no space to work. And so early on in treatment, I, I'm looking just for a little bit of space. Uh, and I love that you said the word space, just a little bit of that margin to, first of all, be like Job's friends. If you're not familiar with the story of Job, it's a fabulous story. It's considered one of the best books in all of history, by the way. So yes, it's in the Bible, but (laughs) if you haven't read it, it's pretty incredible. And here's a man who loses everything but his own life. And his friends come and for several days, they sit with him in the dirt. Mm -hmm. And that was glorious. It's when they open their mouths that all the problems started to happen. (laughs) When they're trying to figure it out, they're trying to find answers, answer the why questions to everything, definitively determine, make all the interpretations. And it's not to say it's wrong for us to make guesses and interpretations or or to affirm what we think and believe. Mm -hmm. But the problem started then. And so I I look for the space. How can I sit with my clients in the dirt? Mm -hmm. Sometimes quite literally as an exposure therapist. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, I bet I was going to say, I bet you have actually sat in some dirt. (laughs) Yeah. 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 But how do I, how do I sit in the dirt in So maybe third thing, besides read some reputable resources, get in community. The third thing is just to create just a a tiny, tiny little space Mm -hmm. where an uncomfortable feeling or thoughts, this is easier said than done, doesn't have to be fused with, oh, I'm I'm already at, at a bad spot. And many times as clinicians, this is where sometimes we just can't do anything. A person is too severe at the time. Their motivation, their readiness, their willingness isn't there, any number of things. And sometimes that's where medication can be really, really helpful because if a person is just constantly feeling like they're rejecting God, blaspheming God, violating their beliefs, values, et cetera, that sometimes something else is needed. And then sometimes it's life happening. Uh, Mm -hmm. I've seen that happen before where uh, sometimes it's literally been development and age where I've seen a, a teen client a year or two after uh, I'd seen them before and they're at a different spot. The person who gets married, the person who has kids, or, there's all these different things. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to prescribe any of those as, hey, fix your OCD by having kids. Yeah, no, some people are doing <laughs> much worse after, some much better, some more motivated, some less motivated for treatment. But yeah, the, the fam here is like, yes, we're tired. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Life uh, <laughs> but I think that, that that third tip is to find the little margin, the little space. OCD wants to carve into those little margins, all sorts of fear. Mm-hmm. So we have to we have to have some 
space foundation that's uh, that's significant enough where I, I can spend some time and put some attention towards that. And uh, a lot of times therapy is going to be really, really useful. But in all fairness, most people are going to show up with their clergy first. Yeah, yeah, they are. And then seconds, the doctors, but not typically on the faith side of things, just yeah. more the medical symptoms. Even, even if you're not a, a practicer of that faith, sometimes just walking into that church, a confessional, going and just walking in and being like, this is what's happening in my life. Do you have anything you can tell me? You know, mm -hmm. and so there is that opportunity, really, to make contact with someone who's really suffering. And it's an opportunity when mental health is hijacking your ability to experience your faith, to experience being good, being moral, whatever that looks like to bridge with that and go, okay, you don't have to be alone in that. And mm -hmm. there is hope. There's not a cure because your brain is, your brain is, is powering this y'all. And so your brain, we can do therapy, but it's not like a, don't have that brain anymore. Oh. We still have the brain, but it's interesting. I, this was kind of a weird analogy, but I don't know if you've ever gotten floaters. Have you ever looked somewhere and you kind of oh, yeah. see like black oh. things trickle? Yeah, Whatever. that's something I got a little obsessive over. I did too. I oh my goodness. I did too. <laughs> I went blind. My grandpa basically went blind. I'm well, like, right. Hey. Yes. My I'm mom, my mom had floaters. Then she got a macular de generation. Oh, yeah, go to the optometrist. Really. And guess what, y'all? I saw those floaters every time because, again, I was being a bit obsessive about it. But I was like, oh my gosh, I see him. I see him. I see him. Yeah, when you're focused on him, you're going to see him, see him, see him, see him. After I went to the optometrist and they're like, yeah, but I mean, like your eyes are fine and this is just your normal aging and whatever. And OK, you know what? I have to think about it. if I think about it before we like say goodbye, I could probably see a floater. But and, but I'm sure it's been going all along. I just stopped focusing on it because I realized it wasn't the problem. And I think that OCD, it's hard for folks to even think it could get to that level. And it's not to say that every obsessional thought could get to that level but you might be surprised because yeah. when you're not focused on the noise around it because you realize this isn't actually my value-driven faith for the example of group of what we're talking about today this is OCD then you can treat it accordingly because you want to engage with your faith and you're not going to engage with the OCD and so that can be really helpful I was talking with a friend not a client but about scrupulosity and and then she brought up something else going on and she's like, yeah, but you know, daddy issues. And I was like, well, you know what's funny about daddy issues? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go I, psychoanalyst on her. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> well, let's say God, you, you could imagine God as your spiritual father, right? And in Christianity, yeah, that is God the father, right? Sometimes we can have daddy issues. And so if our foundation of our faith, like you spoke to it a little bit before, we're not going to be able to to get into it in this episode. It would be a good topic for a future podcast, though, in talking yeah. about that spiritual trauma or whatnot. But if you've had, just like if you had an abusive father in physical life, yeah. if yeah. you've had an abusive relationship, and certainly there can be abusive people in places of power. That's everywhere. That's not just the church, right? And so you can have somebody that has a platform, has power and influence that has been abusive towards you. And if that is part of your foundation, your spiritual foundation, your physical, your emotional foundation, then that is going to have a giant impact in how you process and construct your world. Because that's yeah. at your foundation. It doesn't mean there can't be hope and healing that comes out of that. But it does mean that we can see how trauma, we can see how mental health in any area, whether in our direct family's life, in our spiritual or, or faith-based family's life, in our community, we can see how that can play in. So it does ultimately come down to daddy issues in a non-Freudian way. It can come down to those daddy issues of like, oh, we had a really hard thing here. It's it's mm -hmm. going to bleed into the way yeah. we yeah. interpret yep. the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And folks, folks who struggle with OCD can, uh, can really, really, if fear narrows focus. So narrow in on that. I have to do this. I have to figure this out. I have to figure. Well, there's an interconnectedness for all of us as humans with any number of things. Our experiences, our genetics, yeah. our uh, environments, our personality, our 
neurobiology, fill in the blank. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. That it's a good example. Yeah. Like daddy issues were, yeah. Okay. So, and if you fix it, it may not necessarily fix the OCD. Probably won't. <laughs> right. Cause your brain's right. going to be your brain. Yeah. <laughs> your dad's going to be your dad. Your faith. People. It's been your faith yet. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but it can be renewed. It can be restored and 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 moved to a more value driven place. Well, Justin, this has been fantastic, and I okay. really appreciate you taking the time. Can I ask you one last yeah, just, little? Okay. Go for it. Okay, because I want to respect your your. No, you're your... good. It's <laughs> just my last kind of thought because I think whether we're talking about history and you, and we were going way back in time, you know, at one point, but you see how like oral tradition, how parables, whether if we're thinking of like certain scriptures or whatnot. Um, or use the storytelling. Have you done any of the trainings or have you learned about ICBT at all, inference-based cognitive behavioral therapy? Well, so yes, yeah, I've uh, gone to a couple sessions, CEU sessions, my continuing ed. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely not the person to speak into it, but yeah, it's, it's interesting and I understand some of it. Yeah, it's interesting because understanding OCD and the creation, the reasoning of this really convincing, absorbing story that comes out of that has been such an interesting overlap, I think, with kind of understanding certain how spiritual doctrine has developed over time. And so, yeah, yeah, so I see it in my community here, how how that scrupulosity and those stories have such mm-hmm. an impact. That's why when yeah. people have a good spiritual experience, they might give a testimony of their story, right? Provide that as an example. And I thought, I just yes. <laughs> So ICBG seems like it could be a really good fit for that. And it, yeah. it's something that I've been thinking about more. So I was just curious if you had, if you had looked into that at all. Yeah. So yeah, just uh, briefly through the training that I did. So what, what ICBT offers in its strength so far, according to the research, is a just as good as a question mark on the superior approach to some of the often called purely obsessional you know, thoughts. So if it's harm-based fears, sexual obsessions, religious obsessions. And so I'm really, really curious. Uh, and I guess just the quick note is how I understand it is that classic CBT for OCD, which includes ERP, just to be clear, yeah, is an associative model, meaning that it says the OCD cycle is intrusion, distress, compulsion, relief, but the reinforced cycle. And yeah. then you can add interpretations in there. Sure. And it's the association with the intrusion that the person is distressed after they get this intrusive kind of meaningless thought. So how I understand it is that it's inferential Mm -hmm. (laughs) ICBT. Mm -hmm. So inferential doubt is argued as the starting gate position that the Mm -hmm. person has learned to doubt their senses and doubt their experience. And then they have thoughts that connect to things that uh, dot, 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 and then they're distressed and so forth. It's really, really interesting. I think conversation about it can spur more research and considerations. There's some research out on it as well. It's certainly not dethroned ERP at this point as a gold standard. I hope it never does dethrone. I hope, you know, I hope the more different treatment modules that have evidence showing that it can bring hope and healing yeah, I, I, yeah. is the better. So I'm hoping, ER, I'm hoping nothing gets dethroned. In fact, I hope. Five years from now, we can be like, and there's more things building and we got research well, just going. Well, like act. Yeah. 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 It's, it's yeah. a good therapy. Yeah. Like it's, and alone, it's not better than ERP, but we, most of us love using it, especially with religious themes, uh, yeah. spiritual themes, like how much we have to talk about values and yeah. <laughs> yeah. mindfulness. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that because I've been learning I use CBT more and I was just like, I really oh, like yeah. that for especially like the existential and the religious group, I found found that to be a really engaging yeah. way to approach yeah. it, but very yeah. different, <laughs> very different as well. So thank you again. I am going to draw to a close. I could keep talking, Justin. So we'll have, oh, to, too. We'll have to chat again at some point. So. And if you find yourself nearing the, a book release, you're welcome back anytime. Come and share it with the fam and let us know. Uh, where we can find it and find out more information. But for now, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. You are welcome. Thank you, Nicole, for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for that. 
Well, fam, I really enjoyed this conversation. And, you know, I am I'm struck by what Justin shared about sitting in the dirt and about being in community. He referenced a story from the Bible with Job, noting the devastation that Job had experienced in basically every way possible, short of losing his own life. And Justin shared how crucial it was for Job to have some community in that, to just sit there in the dirt and the mess of it all with Job. And again, I cannot separate my thoughts or feelings from the complete dirt and devastation happening in Israel right now. So for this intrusive thought segment, which is my application segment of the show, I'm going to invite you, fam, to sit with me, to, to sit with the world that is horrified and devastated by these atrocities. I'm inviting you to sit in the dirt just as you are. You can share your thoughts, your prayers. You can just be angry or crushed. You can be numb or you can just focus on breathing. But I'm going to create space and I'm going to create some margin for us to sit in this dirt together. Because there are times, fam, where words fail. No reason can explain. And so we sit and we hold this moment, this silence here in the dirt. We are better together, family. Thank you. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you for joining me and our OCD family community. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please like and subscribe to the OCD family podcast wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Did you find this content helpful? Please consider leaving a review. The more people that know they're not alone, the better. For more information regarding today's podcast, please visit ocdfamilypodcast.com and remember to join the email list while you're there. It will provide you with the most up-to-date information, resources, and the demo on the family chatter. Oh yeah, nothing says family like calling out screw when it tries to pull a do. That's right, I went there. And you can too at OCDF.